Uh, welcome to the October 17th meeting of the Community Preservation Committee. We have one major order of business, which is to hear proposals from three of the applicants this evening, Forbes Library Restoration, Village Hill Apartments, and the King Street Armory. Uh, before we do that, we just have a couple of quick items to get to. The first is, as we always do, we start our meetings with uh, general public comment. Uh, does anyone have any comments they would like to make that don't pertain to these three proposals that are on the agenda for this evening? Okay, moving right along, we have one set of minutes to approve. That was our expedited review of the uh, Guile Self Homeless Shelter on June the 11th. Uh, is there a motion to approve those minutes? A second? Second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Okay, good to go. So the order that we're going to go in uh, is, Sarah, as, as the agenda states, correct? A Forbes Library will be going first mm -hmm. with the window restoration, followed by Village Hill Apartments, and then followed by King Street Armory. <clears throat> just before um, we do that, just one comment, if I, if I may. Um, we have somewhere around $800,000 available to us for both cycles, the fall and the spring. Uh, this cycle for the fall, we have somewhere around $1.6 million in proposals. Uh, so even if we spend all of our money this cycle, leaving none of our money, leaving nothing for next cycle, we would only be able to fund half those requests. So folks uh, with proposals, just keep that in mind that um, it is always our uh, understanding that your proposals are wonderful, that they benefit the community in, in fabulous ways, but we simply do not have the money to fund, to fund all of them. Also, um, please remember that there is a public uh, comment uh, section. So the first Wednesday in November, that's November the 7th, our meeting is turned over to folks who are commenting on the proposals uh, in front of us. So if you have constituents or interested uh, clients or folks that you know who are interested in speaking pro or con to your proposals, please let them know that that meeting is November the 7th. Uh, it can be scary, I know, for people to come up and speak to us. We're really not that scary. But, uh, but encourage uh, anyone to, to come and, and, and speak to the merits of Okay, so let's begin with uh, Forbes. And if you could introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, my name is Lisa Downing, and I'm the director of the Forbes Library. Uh, thank you all for uh, hearing our proposal. Um, our proposal is for restoration of the library's approximately 150 uh, windows. They're original windows. Uh, the library is actually just coming up on its 125th anniversary celebration next year. Um, so they, they have um, uh, been with us since that time. Uh, the, uh, the application details uh, sort of the needs and, and the specifications, but tonight we'll have jo Margo Jones from Jones Whitsett Architect to go over the project in more detail. Um, before she does that, I just want to say, um, couple of quick things. One is that uh, we really believe that the Forbes Library, as all public libraries do, serve a very broad cross-section of our community. Uh, we're proud to serve constituents from birth all the way through to, to folks uh, at the other end of life. And we have programs designed for that. And this building is a community treasure. It's something that we believe is uh, one of the uh, great collectively held resources in our community and we've lovingly restored it as anyone who's visited will tell um, this project would seal the building envelope for us a lot of there's been a major investment including um, by the community preservation committee uh, community preservation act funds 10 years ago to uh, repoint the building and do extensive roof repair um, 
We feel as though the exterior is in very good shape. The only uh, sort of weak link at this point are these windows. So this would um, sort of complete that building envelope. The library houses very important collections, which I tried to highlight in the application. So we have the uh, Calvin Coolidge Presidential Library and Museum, uh, as well as the local Hampshire Room for Local History and the, the photo archives of the Daily Hampshire Gazette and other photo archives collections. Uh, these collections are used extensively uh, by researchers, uh, homeowners, school, school visitors, you name it, both near and far. And they're collections that we um, want to preserve and maintain. The most recent investment in that was uh, through the city uh, up upgraded our HVAC system so that we have climate control now that's specific for these collections. And again, we feel like the only weak link to maintaining accurate humidity for these collections is through the windows. Um, I'll, I'll point out that we have endorsement. This, this project was actually submitted by the city of Northampton. We're working with uh, the Central Services Department and it has the endorsement of the mayor. Uh, it also has uh, the endorsement of our board of trustees who uh, have prioritized this project for years. I've, I've been the director uh, just since last year, but I have notes going back about 25 years where we've identified the windows as something that really needs to be looked at. Um, I think it's, it's, uh, it's a preservation, it's a comfort level, it's, a, it's the sort of the commitment to the building that's, that's been made so far. This will just sort of be the, the final piece that, that will uh, preserve it for, for many, many uh, years and generations to come. Uh, it also has the endorsement of our friends group. In subsequent to submitting the application, we have received the endorsement of uh, the Historic Commission and the Northampton Community, uh, excuse me, the Central, uh, I always get their name mixed up, the, 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 the Central Business Architecture Committee, excuse me. So both of, both of those committees have now um, signed on to those projects. So I will pass out their letters of support at this point, I will turn it over to Margo Jones, who will tell more about the specifics of the project. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And I'll, I'll keep this short, because I'm sure you're familiar by the application with what we're proposing. But uh, it's been a great honor to work on the Forbes Library. It's really one of the major historic buildings in our area, and it, it's been an honor. So uh, I've done a lot of historic preservation work, our firm has, and when we first started, we looked at replacing the windows or else preserving, and um, these windows are really remarkable windows that no other units would last 125 years this well if they weren't extremely well built. So it became clear that the best thing is to preserve them, is to restore them basically, because they're two and a quarter inch thick frame, uh, sash frames, and the glass uh, is a quarter of an inch thick. I mean, it, they were just built really well. So you can't get wood sash that is that free and clear these days. Um, uh, and, and we've done a lot of, of this style restoration. So uh, let me just uh, keep going. The other thing that was good was their single one over one lights. So there weren't a lot of muttons to figure out what to do with. So it really seems very logical to do the approach that we've suggested or proposed. Uh, we did an inventory of the west and the south faces elevations by working on a lift and actually photographing all the conditions and that's what generated the working drawings that, that were distributed to you. Um, so there has been deterioration and certainly 20 years of lack of coding has, hasn't helped, um, but uh, we do think they're saveable um, with some replacement sash supplied as well. Uh, so. As Lisa said, there are approximately 150 windows throughout. Uh, the first floor has storm windows on it. The second floor doesn't have exterior storms. It has interior storms that came with the library. Uh, so that actually means that there's a little more deterioration on the second floor level of those windows than on the first floor. But the good thing is that we can use them as temporary uh, the storm windows will act as temporary sash when the window sash are removed for restoration. 
So I don't know if you can see the details, but basically uh, it, the double hung window has a weight uh, pocket that we would take out the, the weights and put in insulation in that cavity and then put in a, um, uh, this little, there's a, there'll be a uh, weather stripping groove on the side of the sash that then is put into a, a, a insert so that the sash will be able to move on the 30 or so windows that will remain operable, but the rest of them will become fixed. So the biggest improvement, um, and, and <laughs> the sash itself gets routed out and a thicker um, three-quarter inch insulated, uh, double insulated pane of glass will be installed. So overall, the biggest savings is going to be from lack of infiltration. Right now, when the wind blows <laughs> outside, it comes in. Uh, you can hear the rattling of the sash, and um, this, they're just very leaky. Uh, so when you cut down infiltration, you've improved your R value tremendously right there. And then by double glazing the, the window, that also improves the R value. I mean, it, it, it doesn't make it fabulous, but <laughs> It'll probably be an R of four when you're done with extremely improved infiltration rates. Uh, and on the left hand and upper side, you can see our offices. Uh, it's a building that I co-own, and we did this treatment to our office. And I can tell you personally <laughs> that the comfort level and the acoustic privacy and everything and the uh, workability of the windows just went way up and I saved the historic sash there as well um, th this this method's been proven in a lot of historic buildings it's been used at University of Vermont there on the left the Cambridge Library did it in their original section when they expanded and also at Williams College they've used this technique so are there any questions Questions. Yeah. Do you have any sense what the what the uh, energy savings will be, and therefore reduction in operating costs? Just just ballpark. <laughs> ballpark. If it's like my building, my office building, it'll save twenty-five to thirty percent. And our energy costs are. Over fifty thousand dollars, and heating and cooling the costs at this point are fifty thousand dollars a year. Uh, do you have an idea of the longevity of this treatment? And they're one hundred twenty-five years old. Do you think? Well, um, there is a little bit of uh, controversy of not controversy, but differences of opinion about it. Um, uh, the double pane technology, the glazing technology, has really improved over the last 50 years that it's been being done. And it used to be that a double pane um, with section of glass that has a vacuum seal in the middle would sometimes get penetrated and, and get foggy. So that can happen eventually, uh, but it's still glass. And it's still, um, it's the original sash, so you could reglaze that sash. So it's really repairable. Um, on, we're suggesting on the north elevation to not double glaze it, to just remove the existing quarter inch plate glass, fix the sash, and then reinstall that plate glass. Uh, because there is some R value to a double thick paint of glass. And it seemed like on the front, you just want to be as pure as, as possible. <laughs> but they do also need um, the double insulated in uh, other places. It seemed like a good trade off. Yep. Um, given what Brian said about our, our limited funds, and given that this is a request for, for basically half of our funds, um, 
Um, I write in thinking that the nature of this project is such that it wouldn't be that difficult to do a portion of it in one year and another portion in a subsequent year. Okay, you take it. Okay. Yeah, so, so right, we, so I think there's two, the, uh, it is definitely feasible, um, a feasible project. I think the things that we, we sort of thought, okay, how would we go about this? Mm -hmm. uh, and the, there's two priorities. One, the windows that are in the worst shape, sure. and two, the windows that are adjacent to our special collections. So we've identified the west elevation, which is the one if you're driving in the library's parking lot, the one by the big lawn, so both those elevations, as well as on the second floor, the windows that would be adjacent to the special collections. And that, we determined, was about 50% of them. Um, when Margo and I talked about it, we, uh, there's always inflation costs, so I think that the project will cumulatively cost more, uh, and there will be further deterioration. Uh, those are sort of the, the major reasons why we don't want to see this go on any longer than, than necessary. Uh, but it, we have sort of determined, uh, made a plan of action for how we would proceed, should that be necessary. Yeah, the, the hardest part is the painting, uh, mobilizing and demobilizing for that kind of exterior painting a number of times just adds to the cost. Mm -hmm. But the window preservation, uh, the restoration process, the standard people that were bidding on it said it would they wouldn't mind if it was phased. But, um, Would they be scaffolding the whole building? Then? Yeah. No, they don't. They do take the sash out on the inside. Oh, it's the inside. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that makes it a lot yeah. the, easier. The, the rest of the work, like the replacement of the wood and the painting, would be done from the lift. Yeah. And <laughs> why did it? I don't see how phasing hurts the. See the, the right the restoration of the window itself. It doesn't hurt. It's the painting that you know you have to rent the lift and set it up. Oh, just an old rental. Yeah, sure. Chris, uh, this may be better for you, but um, um, the city's share—that's not contingent on anything else. They're just there to borrow the money, and it's going to be there. Yeah, so this, this project has had an interesting bidding history, and I'll let Margo, so it was originally um, d conceived uh, in combination with this HVAC project. So it was the Windows HVAC project, and it was approved through uh, capital improvements for um, just over 600000 just over 700000 And um, when it went out to bid, it came in significantly higher. So they decided to go ahead and do the HVAC project, so that, that is now just about done leaving just about 400,000 left. Um, when we bid this, pro this project has now been bid uh, uh, three times. Three times. <laughs> and the results have varied. Uh, Margo, can you talk a little bit well, about that? Well, the first time it was a combined project, and they were such disparate scopes of work. They really probably never should have been together. But anyway, they were. So that, w we then split it off. and bid the HVAC separately and that was successful and went ahead and then we bid the windows after the HVAC and that came in too high still. There was only one bidder um, but so now we're still, we think third time's a charm for the windows <laughs> <laughs> this, win this winter sometime. So the city's money is there? Yes, yeah, so there is some question uh, to how long they can, so the capital improvements uh, approved this money in FY 16, 16 yeah. to use and suspend in 17. So it's been sitting there. I think that David Pomerantz, who's not here tonight, w w was going back to say how long can this money sit there. I think that's one question. Um, it was approved. I don't know if there's any uh, regulations in terms of how long it can go before mm -hmm. it's actually applied. But was your question, Chris, is there a requirement for any kind of one-for-one -one match? That was the start of my question. Yes. Yeah. No. <laughs> so no. 400000 would be there, and it would be supplemented by whatever amount we might be able to. Yes. And we could certainly bid it with chunks so that, like, maybe two elevations would be, well, what you said, the, mm -hmm. the one elevation and all the, the uh, history, historical rooms, and then add elevation by elevation so we could see what it came in how it add. Lisa can you get that because Sarah uh, 
to make sure that that 400,000 is still available? Yes, I will, I will find that yeah, out. We can do that in the next few days. I think that'd be really helpful okay. for us to have that knowledge. Okay. Uh, other questions? I had a question in there about the thickness of the glass, and I guess I had some confusion. I, my, my concern is this, is that I guess when we were over there, you said it was three inch, inch glass currently. I believe I'm to make sure that when there's glass being changed out, that it's that the sashes can take the weight of what if somebody's going in heavier, but it sounds like it's not going to be any heavier right. than the glass that's there. Right. And I guess the second question is, is there any spanning issue that some, there's some big windows there is double, <coughs> double quarter inch units, right? Right. And there's no issue that, that, that anything's too big for that thickness of glass or anything. I wouldn't think so. I just want to make sure that's been checked. Uh, we've checked with the restoration company and they, mm -hmm. they, they think it's fine. Okay. Yeah. It, it, he, I, he was saying that the double glazed eighth inch glass, it's, it's two pans, paints of eighth inch. Oh, oh I know. Well, I, right. Um, we're actually adding a film layer of UV blocking film, so that actually means that there's three layers of, it, of glass mm -hmm. uh, all blended into the into the um, double glazing unit. So it's mm -hmm. like two two pieces of glass merged together, and then an airspace, and then another right. layer of glass. And that's pretty heavy. So they were checking, but they said it won't be heavier than what's in there now. So. Good. And the UV blocking we put everywhere in this last bid, mm -hmm. except for the north elevation, which used the old glass. You said the last time you went out to bid, oh, there was only one bidder? Yes. And you'll go out to bid again? Do you anticipate just one bidder again, or is there? No, no. There's. When when was this? Um, it was a busy time. It was June or July, and everybody was really busy. So, we have heard like Renaissance builders who bid on the first time are, are very interested. So there is interest in doing it, and I think if we bid it in the winter, for spring start, it'll it'll be good. We can get on people's schedules. <laughs> But it is a busy time. Contractors are busy. And this is, you know, not an easy job. So we expect to get more bidders. We can't always. <laughs> the first time we bid it, there was four or five that actually four. bid it. Four yeah. that bid it. Yeah. So there was interest the first time we did it, so which was a bigger project. So. Right. Right. But they might have had the same subs for the window portion. The window portion, correct. Mm -hmm. I've still been one bitter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, true. Yeah. The, the but the numbers know, it's, were it's pretty specialized work. But the, the, yeah. the numbers were four hundred thousand dollars apart, though. Yeah. <laughs> Even with the same sub subcontractor, so. For this portion. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, thank you, Lisa and Margo and. Uh, Jason Hudson. Yeah, sorry, I sorry. should have introduced him. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I will get back with that information. You're welcome to stay, or you're welcome to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so next up is uh, Phyllis Hill Apartments. Back, back of the site. Um, 
and the other is a 12-unit building um, in the front. And we didn't have names for them when we were here last time. Now we do. A little more than the big one. Yeah, we call it a little big. And now we can call it um, 35 Village Hill Road, which is its uh, proper address, and North Commons. And um, we have, since since last fall, we've advanced the drawings on, on both of these uh, buildings with Davis Square. Um, the larger building, North Commons, is a passive house designed um, project. We can talk more about that in a bit. But um, uh, TCB uh, sought an opportunity to submit the small building in a relatively new funding round that the state came out with called Community Scale Housing Initiative. Um, it's the second year they put it out, and it, it was a May um, deadline. And it's for uh, projects that are uh, small in, in small cities, so populations under 50,000 and projects under 20 units. Um, there are no tax credits in this program, um, so just sort of soft money, as we call it. And uh, we uh, were just, so, so then when we reapplied for CPC this September, not just a month ago, um, we, we reapplied again. Um, you had committed the 50000 to us uh, last um, fall, and um, that helped us in our application for 35 Village Hill for this community scale round. Um, so between when we submitted the, and we have an updated timeline for you, but between when we submitted the, this CPC application just a month ago, and today, uh, we were uh, told that we were awarded funding for the small building. So thank you for the commitment, and it really does help. Um, and uh, so we are now uh, sort of officially uh, bifurcating our two buildings. And they will have different timelines, and, and Laura has a handout for you for what those are. Um, but essentially, the small building uh, is for us, it, it's a sort of lean financing model. It's just a couple key sources. Um, so assuming that we can keep our um, construction budget where it needs to be, um, <laughs> we are looking to um, go out to bid, select a general contractor, close on our financing, and start construction on the small building, 35 Village Hill Road, uh, this on uh, the spring of 2019. So that's uh, that's great news uh, for that uh, lot. It's called Lot 20 up at Village Hill. It was, um, uh, I think, Mass Development and the city have been really wanting to see that particular lot developed. It's close to the front of the site. Um, the city wanted uh, wants uh, some commercial um, on the ground floor, and so. Um, that will be a combination of both a uh, new management office suite for the community builders, um, and in, in total we will have um, about 150 units to manage up at Village Hill after North Commons is built, um, as well as about 1,000 square foot uh, commercial space right at the corner of Village Hill Road and Olander Drive. And that's 35. Um, North Commons. Uh, so, so I guess we are here to sort of officially request that the 300,000 we are applying for um, is specific to the North Commons building, which is the one not yet funded. Um, and we will be uh, applying to the uh, next um, low income housing tax credit uh, round, which will be a February 2019 application. Um, yeah, sure. So this is, you know, we tried to break them out because when we wrote the application, it was confusing. You know, if we get funded, we'll do this. If we don't get funded, we'll do that. So things are both better and simpler now um, in that we have the one project. It's very clean. The 50,000 CPA money is dedicated to it. And it's going forward on a pretty aggressive timeline. Um, we, the funds that were awarded, we expect to do financing closing in the spring. Uh, in April, construction start. Uh, finish the following spring and then be able to offer those units for occupancy. Um, North Commons, which would be going in for an application, is kind of a year behind and it's a slightly longer construction schedule because it's a significantly bigger project. We're, we're feeling optimistic um, in that the state has already kind of got a toehold into this uh, location uh, and this project and so 
Um, we think that our odds are good. We never know for sure. As you folks know, it's very competitive at the state level to go in for funding. Um, they look um, with great interest at the level of local commitment. So um, the other local money that's in is uh, the city committed some CDBG funds, and it's kind of a split, uh, as with the CK. Um, that 50000 was kind of earmarked for uh, 35 Village Hill Road, making the total local money $100,000. Um, and a balance of 100000 is kind of already committed for uh, North Commons. Um, so that's good. So the other sort of fact, uh, competitive factors, um, zoning, which we uh, got earlier this year, it was January. Um, so, so we have all our planning approvals, the so local commitment, as Laura mentioned, um, the, the level of design advancement. So uh, we've been sort of moving the building forward with our energy consultant because it's this passive house building. It, it requires some special sort of design of uh, insulation and um, air circulation. And um, you know we're, we're doing some estimating as we move that along. So um, the numbers came in a little high. We looked at, oh, can we change the roof? And we decided we, we could not do that. And it wasn't going to really um, give us the sort of cost savings we were hoping for. So we're looking at other wall type options, um, window options. And it's all very sort of intense um, now in that kind of pre-construction design phase, but very advanced for sort of like 70 to 80% design. And, and that's another sort of factor for this state. Um, and this passive house uh, technology is also getting some attention. There's, um, there's been some money funded, um, a, a new pilot program that the state's coming out with uh, that we're applying for for this project. And um, so we, we completely meet all the criteria for funding. It's not a lot of money, but, um, but it go, I think it goes a long way for um, supporting the project for the uh, February round. Any questions? Yeah. So you said these are two different projects. So the budget that you're showing though, the 23 million, mm -hmm. that's for both together? That is for so both you, together. What are they so, it's, so for North Commons, it is a $19 million dollar, um, 53 unit project. Yeah, in the application itself, because these had already started to we started to cost them separately, you do have both budgets independently in the application. So oh, they are both. Yep, yep. Um, so there's one for 35 uh, Bill Children, and there's a separate one for uh, North Commons, both the development side and the operating side of uh -huh. um, those projects. So I do I did know that the total budget went up $4 million since you applied last year. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty, it's 25%. Mm -hmm. Are you still carrying for so what's behind that? Uh, just get, getting estimates. As it sounds like you're adding scope too. I mean, if you're going to passive house, that's going to add cost. Yeah, um, we had started the North Commons concept, wanting to do passive house, and then sort of so so it, it was part of the original concept. We didn't have the numbers to show that at the time because we didn't have the design advanced. I'm not sure. I understand. Oh, you mean it wasn't in the budget previously? So it was right. always intended to be a passive house building, um, but until it, we started to actually design it, the actual costs associated with achieving that goal, we didn't realize is that, that in the budget. Could, is, is some of your funding contingent on it being a passive house project? Um, this application that I just spoke about, this new money from the state, energy money, um, it would be 200000 So if we, if we didn't... Um, we didn't make it a passive house building, we would not get those funds. I assume it's probably adding at least over a million dollars, I imagine. Probably a, about a million is what we're yeah. seeing. Mm -hmm. Can you explain to us for the passive house? What? Oof, I can try. <laughs> um, the idea is that it's a very well insulated envelope, very, very tight. Um, and it needs a constant air exchange um, in order to sort of balance that. Um, and it essentially, uh, you know, if there's a question about you know reduction in heating bills. It's this. This is more like a 75 percent reduction, um, and so we're we're not underwriting quite to that level, um, but we're expecting you know at least a 50 percent savings on uh, energy bills. It's also very quiet inside. The uh, the the noise level um, is is remarkable. I'm told in, in these buildings, and TCB has. Um, has built a multifamily passive house building in Pittsburgh, 
a Seeger building. So we've done this. Um, but it's fairly, you know, cutting edge technology here. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I, you know, people talk about zero net and near zero net, and this is kind of getting into that family of it's not quite zero net, but it's pretty close. And we're looking at solar panels on this building, trying to get as close to zero net as we can with it. It also looks at, you know, a lot of interior comfort. So the temperature differential that you might feel, you know, standing near a window or coming off of the floor, it addresses some of those. It's really a lot about air quality, indoor air quality, comfort level, and then huge energy efficiencies kind of combines those factors. Have you been invited to apply or are those invites not yet gone out? Not yet. Um, the pre-app is to at the end of November. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And have there been discussions with the HCB? I assume there have been, but what, what's, what's been the, the word from them? Yeah, so they're aware that TCB is coming in with this building. Mm -hmm. um, they are very excited about funding 35 Village Hill Road. Um, and so, you know, we, it, it was nice to be able to submit that application because it um, allowed us to also give them a sort of preview of North Commons. But, they, but there hasn't been an extensive discussion about this particular about North Palm. So, uh, are they giving you any signals, or they're just? <laughs> I I don't I can't read their signals. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think there's any question that this is a, a type of project that would be of interest yeah. to the state. I think it's really often about who else is in the queue, how many other applications yeah. are going in. Some of the features that I mean, they would be interested in the, the passive house design. They like Northampton. It's a, called an area of opportunity for affordable housing, so it's seen as a, a good place mm -hmm. to place. Um, this, you know, has a nice mix of, of family and and smaller units, which they favor. Um, the North Common is planned to have, I think, it's ten uh, FCF units, so ten units that are set aside for very long term folks um, through the who are referred through the Department of Mental Health. Um, several CBH units, which they also are interested in for people who might otherwise be institutionalized. So we know that it's programmatically going to be attractive. The other interesting thing about this, um, and you know, it's, it's kind of a favorite of the planning department to mix affordable low-income housing with more market rate housing. And so North Commons and, and 35 Village Hill Road have a mix of kind of traditional low-income housing with what's called workforce housing. So it's a different funding source through the state that uh, targets Really between 60% and 120% AMI. It starts to feel a little bit more like market housing. Um, and so that will also be very attractive, both at the Northampton level as well as uh, at the state funding level. So are all the, the, all the project based vouchers then are intended for yes. North Common. Yep. And you, you may have said it in here, but I was, and I don't think you may think even through the funding, but I was just curious what the unit, I, I saw there's zero, but. I didn't see how many of each. Yeah. So in North Commons, um, um, we have eight studios. Is this the, the matrix you're looking for? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, eight studios, 19 ones, 22 twos, and four threes. For a total of 53. So you had a market study yes. that indicated that it, there wasn't a need for more three bedrooms? Yes. Are there any three bedrooms in the No. In the clothing? No. That's there are two. There are four two, I think. Yeah, if you look at the, you know, if you look at the census data on, you know, what the average rent household size is, it's small. It's two people, so it tends to be quite small. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of income spread, if you're interested in that, it's, it's a big range. Um, there are 10 very low income, 30% AMI units, 4 50% units, 10 60% units, 16 80% units, and 13 120% units. So it almost starts to mimic 
a real world situation where you have people at all different mm -hmm. kind of socioeconomic levels in one building. It's a little unusual for affordable housing to have that. It's the real world, but it's not the segregated housing that we all know. Um, and I, I noticed that the assumed um, construction bridge loan interest rate has gone up quite a bit between the two, and that's just based on what you're seeing. Yeah. It's, it's, does that make, will make a huge difference? That has not helped. Yeah, cost of funds have gone up. Construction costs are <laughs> spiraling upward. Um, the value on the tax credits took a hit after the tax reform. So all those things kind of put pressure on this, mm -hmm. the budget. But do the rents include heat and hot water? Yes. And I think we highlighted this last time, but a lot of the um, we did a lot of site planning for this particular building, um, together with the folks who live at Village Hill. Um, and so, you know, we think in terms of CPA money, this is gonna hit on a housing note, um, as well as preservation of open space, because there's a significant portion of open space that will be committed. Um, land over here is intended to be used for a co-housing group. Um, and then, you know, we're building out a playground and kind of playing field area. Um, that will be available to all the residents um, at Village Hill. So it's a nice feature to kind of bring that to the to the campus up there. This is one of the last sites um, left for development at the Village Hill. Yeah, I'm just piggybacking on the open space piece, there's um, you know, over 30 acres sort of in the back of here that'll be um, uh, restricted for conservation, and we're, we're building out the trail system um, up at the so there are nice connectors to the bike trails. Um, there is a bus stop um, right on Route 66, mm -hmm. kind of at the, the front gateway area of Village Hill. So in terms of access and transit, and it's a, it's a mile walk to town. People who live at Village Hill seem to do it fairly often. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a small commitment, but you can, it's not that far. Great going, coming back. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. We do have the new bike share. Right. 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 Bring us past the market. That's right. The bike share on the way back. So true. Yes. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
And so all things are relative. Um, so we're trying to come in below market. And the other thing to consider is that these rents include utilities. So if you go on Craigslist and you're looking around for apartments, it's pretty rare that you find something where all the utilities are included. Um, we're <laughs> because we're doing a sergeant house at Bridge Street, I was cruising, you know, looking around. There's a one that next door to our building for twenty five hundred a month. Twenty five hundred. There's one across the street for nineteen hundred. These are one bedroom units. So that may be a little extreme. That's up on yeah, it's up on Bridge Street. I mean, it, <laughs> so it, it's gotten a little out of hand um, what the actual market rents are uh, in the Northampton area. And the, the other piece of um, you know we are trying to achieve a balance here of um, um, having the affordable housing, but also you know being able to to offer that with this mixed income approach, and so. Um, you know, we, we want, quite, quite honestly, we want our market rents to be quite as, as aggressive as possible so that we can get more debt and, you know, support the project fully. Um, so there's, you know, competing goals. So those rents were based on the market study, which did a broader look. I mean, I'm just throwing out some big numbers, but, you know, that was a more comprehensive look at what are the going rates for you know, studios ones, twos, and threes um, in the Northampton area. Especially at Village Hill. I mean, Village Hill's come to be, you know, it, yeah, we're pretty our scale place. It is for home ownership, and we're hoping to realize that on the right side. Other questions? Just a follow-up to that. How, how do these rents, um, the subsidized, um, compared to some of the public housing facilities in the city? So in general, public housing is going to mimic that 30% tier that I was talking about. Um, almost all public housing is um, the same. So if you qualify, if you're very low income, you enter, and you pay 30% of your adjusted, they do a formula, but basically 30% of your gross income goes for rent. Um, and it's adjusted for utilities. I think the minimum is like $50 a month. There's, just, there's a minimum, but it's pretty low. Mm -hmm. So that is very similar to the public housing model. Um, you know, key difference is it's not not everybody's right. at a very low income range. Yes. You're having this kind of spread of mm -hmm. socioeconomic backgrounds. Yep. What well, what's the area area medium income number now? Family of four. So the, the 80% is around, probably around 54,000. For a family of four? Yeah. 50. Yeah, 90. Yeah. yeah. We can get you the Yeah, we'll get you the right number. And is this the same number of um, <coughs> affordable rental apartments that you had in the last proposal? Yes. And, and so essentially the only thing that's different is you've separated. Yeah. That's, where, that's where we're at. Yes. Other questions? Um, so as you know, we're really struggling with the amount of money that we have. And in that this is a, a $19 million uh, proposal, um, the city has al already committed $100,000 to this, is that what you said? The city has committed 100000 to CBG money. Okay. Uh, and, and I guess my question, may not be able to answer this is uh, you you come in for a three hundred thousand dollar request to us correct yes um, and at, at what level uh, does it make it a, a large enough difference to tilt the balance in other words if we don't come in with three hundred thousand is there a, a sort of an unfair question but is there another another figure that you think would be looked upon by the state as, as helping the project out. Well, I, I can start by saying that I think that the request is consistent with the other requests that have come in recently for other affordable housing projects um, that have been funded. Um, you know, there's no scientific answer to that question. Um, I think that the, um, the commitments 
that were made for the 50,000 in CPC last year really helped the small building, and that's 50,000 to 4 million. Um, so if you're you know trying to look at that scale, it would warrant you know something harder for a 19 million dollar project. Um, I don't know. I mean, we last year we did talk about sort of openness to phasing. Um, and this project has been kicking around, um, and it's, you know we've advanced the design and trying to make it as competitive as possible for funding. This, um, you know, as time goes on and, and the, the risks of interest rates and tax credit equity and construction costs, those the time does not work in our favor. Um, and so, um, to the extent that we can be as ready as possible, as committed as possible, we are presenting the best, most competitive application to this state. You know, I think I think they see that when the local commitment really is part of that mix. We, we have a budget gap, so <laughs> every dollar counts. You know, we, we, it, it, that's the reality of it is, is we're seeing an escalating construction market. Um, so it's not like we can walk away really from any amount of money and not feel it in kind of terms of impact on the project. We could use more. Honestly. That's kind of what I was asking at the beginning. I mean, you're adding the passive house, which I, mean, I don't know what I don't know more of the details of your project. There might be, what, there's other things. I assume you've gone through some PE process. Mm -hmm. the passive. I mean, adding a million dollars because I mean, I love the passive house. It's a great thing to do. Because you know, I mean, Northampton doesn't even have stretch code. Right. I mean, do it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Do it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you don't have the. Oh, it's on the map. I don't yeah. It seems like it's adding a bunch to a project. Like you said, you have a gap. Like. Why? I mean, have you yeah. looked at that, or are there other yeah. things you've, yeah. you've cut already? I mean, yeah, we've looked at it. We've looked at this playground. You know, it's a pretty big site. You know, there's a lot of stuff we're trying to achieve here. We're, we're not ready to compromise on those goals. We think that that is part of what makes it a very marketable um, rental development. We're, we are trying to attract a market. Um, you know, I, I think it puts, you know, Northampton is on the map as a, you know, best, one of the best small cities, right? And I think. You know, having a passive house um, multifamily building, there aren't many in the country, and it puts us on the map here too. So I think you know we are trying to, um, to to bring a development that we think is is really um, an appropriate uh, Northampton uh, kind of development that we can be proud of. So if we have to cut stuff, you know, if we're fully funded and we have to go through BE. That is one of the last things that I'm going to put on the chopping block. So, I'm not saying you have to cut that. It <laughs> seems like I, I think we're. I mean, you heard what the issue we have with the, with with, the, with our all the asks, and I think you're right that we have funded other projects at that mm -hmm. rate, but the the our budget <laughs> was in a really different place at that time. I, mean, mm -hmm. just, that's not, I don't think it's possibly on the table to do that. Yeah, and our our passive house piece does not affect our ask. You know, I oh, yeah, and give that. Yeah. So what is your budget yet? What did you guess? Um, I guess it's about one and a half million. Oh. Uh, so just I, so I have it straight. The, the uh, proposal goes in in February of yes, 2019. Yeah. And then you would hear in September. Yeah, August or September. Theoretically, the state would award in March of 2020. Yeah. And then you would begin construction sometime following that. Right. That's when we would um, expect to close and start construction. Okay. Other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. And but again, the uh, two of you are welcome to stay. Thank you. But welcome to leave. <laughs> so last but certainly not least is the King Street Armory. And we have a number of service net folks in, folks in the back, so speak to that. Thank you for waiting patiently for the other two projects.
through the internet. Yes, it is. But just in case. Okay, thank you. Did everybody get that? I think Sarah sent it out today. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. fact on that is that the, uh, during the Second World War, the uh, waves actually drilled there as well. There was a whole waves training program at Smith College. And, and, uh, um, in terms of civic use, um, a couple of things we found which were very interesting about this building was that uh, during the Great Depression in the 1930s, a number of uh, civic leaders, politicians, and citizens in Northampton were concerned about unemployed men, which we interpret as perhaps being people who might be called homeless now. And there was a decision to open the armory up in the winter of 1934 so that people could um, take showers, get out of the cold, have some time for recreation, um, and presumably uh, have a place to kind of stabilize, which is somewhat similar to what we do with our homeless shelters right now. Um, also found out that it was it served as a shelter during the times of the great hurricane in 1938. Apparently there were some terrible floods in the spring of 1939 and families from Ware, the eastern part of the county, were in residence in the large drill hall in the back. Um, and you know, it, ServiceNet has continued that part of the tradition of maintaining social service, human service programming in the building. And so our hope is to be able to keep this building alive and functioning and restore it back to the uh, way it looked uh, in the early part of the 20th century. Um, <clears throat> we, your packet has um, a number of uh, the facts in it. We've, we've enclosed in the application of the newspaper articles um, and the history timeline that this building has had. We, again, back in 1965, 69, it, be, it became vacant after the armory opened and then it became a commercially developed place with a number of different shops and um, ServiceNet became one of the earlier tenants. Um, and where it is now, we've, we've got um, four programs going in the building right now to serve people with various mental health needs and other kinds of social supports. So um, we intend to keep 
keep that going. And um, we'd, we'd, I'll definitely need some assistance in preserving and restoring the building. The application has there's a picture of one of our programs called the Recovery Zone, uh, where a number of people you know, with mental health issues come and have uh, day activities and socialization. It's very important. Um, I'm not going to talk about this, but my colleagues will talk about the specific plans, but I wanted to give you the context of why this building is so important to us. It has been one of our mainstay sites for many years. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tom Gross. I'm, uh, I'm an employee of ServiceNet's uh, facility department. Uh, I know I met some of you folks at that walk around. Um, since we, we had that walk around, we did have an engineer come through. I think one of the questions you rose was um, the longevity of the building and how much likes to have left in it. Um, so in that, I think they submitted that report from the engineer. There was no big smoking gun, that oh my gosh kind of moment. Um, there is some things in the basement with the buttresses the south wall that needs some work. Um, so it's just a building that's showing its age at, a, you know, over 100 years old. And um, we just like to keep it, it's, it's such an important building for Northampton. I think it's, you know, the gateway to Northampton um, with that main artery in to downtown. Um, and our goal is to just to make it, you know, keep it up and make it look like an historic building, like it, you know, like it was intended to be. I mean, the windows are a big thing for us uh, just because we don't have the luxury of a, like a Forbes library had the original windows. We don't have that. I think as some of you saw, the aluminum windows. Um, but the pointing is, is one of the big things. The um, fixing up the, the walls in the basement and, and new windows. And we'd like to make it look like that picture that, that Seth pointed out there earlier in the slide earlier um, with that style of window just so it maintains the look of, of how it was when it was built. Any questions? I don't have time to read that report from the engineer, but uh, there's some, some cracked floor joists there that need to be dealt with, but nothing too major. Thanks, Tom, and, and thank you for your time the other day. It was, it was, a good, it was good to be able to see it. Um, I did get a chance to quickly look at the report that was sent over. Um, I realize it's a, it's an engineer's report, but I I'd, I'd be interested in getting a feel for um, uh, cost estimates of the, on the specific repairs that he that he was recommending um, because I I know that well, I shouldn't say I know I suspect that they're not specifically addressed in the proposal. That's for us, um, there. But yeah, so I, I, um, I, I think it would be helpful to us to have a better understanding of that because it may very well be that even within your proposal, um, you're going to need to do some reprioritizing. Pre Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. Um, to uh, to um, to look at that. Um, but it was very very helpful to have that. Is is there going to be any more to it? I, I got for some reason I I got the feeling that was sort of a preliminary draft. We literally Saturday morning. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then he sent it to us yesterday afternoon. Okay. So it was here's the report. Quickly read through it. So we haven't had, even had time to sit down as a okay. group and, and talk about um, the things that are in it. Um, but some of those things need to be addressed, and we need to you know get some some cost estimates on yeah. those repairs. Okay. Uh, that would be, be good. And okay. if you can at least let us know what the timeline for that is, so we can know what to expect. But that'd be that'd be great. Yeah, and over the next week and week or two, we'll work on you know getting those things together. Great, thanks. Okay. When we were on site, you someone mentioned that there was a study done about extensive renovations, and that the, there had been bigger issues that were too expensive, so it was not undertaken. Right, and then there was a structural report that had been done, maybe a more extensive structural report at that time. I think that's what I just I don't think we were asked. I mean. I'm glad you had an engineer going out there. That's great, but I thought we had thought that there was a previous report that had already been written. There was a um, uh, 
not a structural engineer, but a systems engineer come through because we wanted to do some renovations in the whole back half and make it our headquarters and, mm -hmm. and do central so air protection. protection and yeah, like yeah, so it's just an engineer when we're looking at that. So it wasn't a structural engineer by any means, it was more of a systems engineer. Yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, chime in here. I'm Sue Stubbs, the CEO of ServiceNet, mm -hmm. and we had mentioned to you that an engineer had been there, and we were looking at doing some major renovations uh, a few years ago, and we did have an engineer come through. We contacted the architect that we had worked with, but we decided not to go forward with that project, mm -hmm. but the architect had done a certain amount of work and had provided some drawings, some preliminary drawings for us, so we contacted her to find out who that engineer was and whether she had anything written. We had never received anything in writing, but we had gotten advice that it was it was worth renovating the building, it wasn't falling apart, and we would have gone, had we gone forward with that renovation, we would have probably gotten a more detailed, uh, a, a different person. But we thought that was a structural engineer, but it turned out it was somebody else and she didn't have any report. So that's why we scurried around, we got sure. an engineer to come in so that we could give you some uh, information. And also to address the question about if it turned out that uh, there was more expensive or extensive work that had to be done um, on the building. We've kept the build, we've put a lot of money into the building over the years and we have other resources. We do fundraising, we can use a certain amount of our administrative overhead money to do uh, repairs and that sort of thing. Uh, we are. All, we also. I think we we uh, mentioned this when we when we saw you at the building that we are uh, in the process of refinancing the building and taking some cash out. And uh, you know, we can certainly assure you that whatever we need to do to make sure the building isn't um, unsafe or you know uh, needs major structural repairs, that we would go forward with that. Um, having um, we own the buildings and obviously have a big investment in keeping them. Uh, keeping the value and keeping them from uh, being dangerous in any way or anything. So we would definitely, we do definitely have other resources um, available. I, I thought the question was asked about, excuse me, about the refinancing and the response was that there, I think there's $200,000 or something in the mm -hmm. budget from that. Mm -hmm. So are you indicating that, and I thought that was the, the suggestion was that that was the max, that you'd already done that. Are you, suggesting that there might be more available through the Well, we're, um, our bank is very um, collaborative with us and, and uh, tries to, we've been working with the TD Bank for many years on a number of projects and uh, they're, actu they're actually the bank that's financing, that financed the building of our new building um, on Village Hill. Um, and if they felt, I mean, they're uh, very invested in us and, and we have a partnership of many years, so if, if we were to, for example, to go to them and say, we just discovered that we have to put an extra $100,000 into making sure the building is uh, safe and, and you know structurally sound and so on, um, they would work with us. We haven't gotten into the detail of the refinance yet. It's so far just preliminary. So they appraisal or anything like that? Yes, we did. Oh, and did. Yes, and so we is also- So room in the appraisal then? Uh, we have the appraisal and um, we also had to do another, we were surprised we had to do it because we did another one uh, when we bought the building, um, an environmental um, study, which was this thick, we had it from 10 years ago and they wanted us to do it again, even though we haven't been. That uh, property prior to, um, prior to us using, uh, to buying it was, or prior to us renting it, had been uh, used for an auto mechanic shop of some sort. So there was concern then that um, there might be environmental problems with it. So there was a very thorough report done at that time, and um, we haven't been repairing cars there <laughs> since then. So we were surprised, and nothing has gone on in that property since uh, of that nature since we've had it, obviously. But the bank required us to do it again, so that came through fine, and so it's, it's in process. I guess that's the best way to. Um, and if we did need to. Um, we, we do have a, a budget, uh, our annual budget is about $70 million as an organization. So we, ha we have some flexibility to choose to do this repair versus that. We have a capital budget every year that we put a certain, we are able to put a certain amount of our revenue into capital projects like repairing roofs and so on. We make a, we always have a list of priorities. So if something in um, this building were, were to come up as a priority, we would have the option of 
the flexibility to put something else on the back burner a little bit or um, <laughs> um, You, this is a, a very big ask for this building, and um, not for the build. I mean, the building is is a, is a, is a signature building. It's um, mm -hmm. the services provided within it are very important to the community. It's it's the um, it's the amount of funding that we have, and I will say a certain feeling that your costs are really not very well defined. Mm -hmm. um, and part of the dilemma that, that I have in thinking about this is if we put some money in and mm -hmm. it's not enough, um, I don't think we're in a position to be looking at funding this on an ongoing mm -hmm. basis, cycle after cycle, so right. we need some assurance that the money in is going to accomplish its purpose. Mm -hmm. And I'm not feeling that assurance right now because mm -hmm. it all feels a little squishy and soft and mm -hmm. well, uncertain to me. And I'm having a hard time um, translating, and it's a difficult question, but I'm having a hard time translating your answer into knowing how much you really need mm -hmm. of, the, of the community. Yeah, you, you bottom line need because I don't think we can fund anything more than your bottom line mm -hmm. need. On well, this. we were looking to you for external restoration, which is historical in nature, as opposed to we need to redo the HVAC for the building. We've had we've sort of have it pieced together with window air conditioners and that sort of thing. So we we have plans to do some interior things that have nothing to do with really preserving it. It's historical value, so we've been asked. Uh, we we have those uh, plans separate from what we were coming to you for, which is the external. And it, and it, it, I know you asked the same question to the other groups, and the answer is pretty much the same. If um, you know, we realized the money. We didn't know when we first wrote the proposal what the total pool of money was. So yes. we kind of came up with all of the things that could be done. To the exterior that we would like to in the, an ideal world do to the exterior of the building to restore it to its original uh, 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 the way it looked so if uh, there's less money available we would prioritize uh, what we could do with the external and put some of the projects on hold and find other resources to do it it's uh, it's kind of an ongoing project I guess like like owning a very old home, you know, you, you could put an almost unlimited amount of money into it and you decide uh, how much money you can secure from various places and which things you can do, which things you have to wait on, so. So would it be feasible to put your funds into the exterior and put a hold on the uh, heating air conditioning? We could, yeah. Mm -hmm. Tom, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Um, it's all about the priorities, you know, when, how much money we have. The structural repairs need to be done as a priority, you know, I feel more so than the windows. Uh, the pointing, you know, finish the pointing so that if you keep waiting, as you know, things get worse and the bricks start falling off and then the repairs get more. So I think any money that would come up with it right away would be the priority would be fixing the structural things and the pointing. Uh, and then, you know, as a nonprofit, we don't have big pockets to dump into it so you know the windows would be the, my next priority you know the comfort stuff on the inside the HVAC you know I would you know say we wait as long as we can on those things we still have heating systems got window air conditioners but mm -hmm. it's keeping the building structurally sound mm -hmm. it's the big thing so the 392 that you're asking for that doesn't line up any you can't take any budget numbers from your exterior scope of work and get to 392 exactly. I mean, sort of back, they came up with a total budget and then took away, you know, took out other sources of funding. Right. I mean, I have the same worry that, I mean, we've had this happen quite recently where we're, we're into a project and then it turns out to cost a lot more just to do, you know, just, I, I really worry when I see these numbers on replacing the windows and, and even, to be honest, even the H, I don't know what, you know, where this estimate of 309,000 for the HVAC system, but, you know, but a building like that to put central AC is a fair amount of structural work and I have to We had a, to do a that. firm out of um, Central Mass come out. We did some work on our other building, our new yeah. building on Orlando Drive. Right. And they 
you know, again, it was, it was kind of a short notice, but they came, put it all together, and came up with that number uh, mm -hmm. on how to heat and cool that, that building. Mm -hmm. so Does that give you documentation of what would be involved? Yeah, well, we have the estimate. Yeah. We, um, Not the estimate, but like the scope, like what's, what do they do? Mm -hmm. Like that, because that should be part of this application, mm -hmm. I feel like. There's, okay. there's a we fair also, amount. We also do trust the numbers. Um, be, partly because of the work that we just went, we just went through a major construction project with that, but also because of the Pleasant Street project, uh, which uh, we had gotten, we had another, this is a little bit of a tangent, but we had a major structural problem with our outpatient clinic building on Pleasant Street, and we got estimates um, that were at least twice as much as this contractor ended up, and he did the work, and he did a really high quality job, so. Um, they're very, I think they're very efficient and very competent, and we, we do trust that it's not going to escalate into, into more than, than what they're saying. It's R.P. Um, Masiello who's, who's doing that uh, Atwood Drive down down toward the Oxbow, that development there. They did some uh, some renovation work on uh, uh, Main Street and Greenfield, so they, they're used to working on buildings of, of our age mm -hmm. and new stuff, and mm -hmm. it's the same engineer that did our work did the work for us on Pleasant Street with that structural, mm -hmm. uh, structural. Okay, I'm not questioning the integrity of the potential contractor. No, but then we can trust the numbers. There's nothing in the public record that says here's what the project is and how do you judge whether it's been successful or not. Right. right. It's really hard to, to judge. Um, just also following up on the uh, what um, David and also Chris were saying about the structural. Um, I'm reading this report. I realized he was. This was short notice, and he was asked to do this in a very concise way. Um, I just found the conclusions to be um, pretty vague, and I'm just wondering if you can pin them down a little bit on what possible structural concern um, versus may cause structural concern. And then his last sentence says items that are a structural concern are, and then the end sentence is not finished. So I'm just saying this because I think this is important to the integrity and the longevity of this building. And so um, I think putting resources into this is probably a pretty high heart priority, but I do think you probably need to pin them down a little bit more mm -hmm. on what these things actually mean and to also complete you know, what the things are real concern are. Yeah, we do plan to get a, a more complete report, but we wanted to come with something okay. to let you know yep. that we're yeah, proceeding no, we with yeah. yeah. an opinion. <laughs> um, Preliminary opinion. Professor note that I mean, he, he, note 11 of 11 is perimeter brick walls requiring repointing at various locations, yet most of the ask is for repointing. So, is repointing actually some, and there's spot repointing and then there's full repointing, and it looks great when the building's fully repointed. But is that really what this building needs, mm -hmm. considering all of the long list of priorities? Well, we did two, three? Three sides. Three sides of the mm -hmm. repointing. We, we already did. Mm -hmm. So, so, and, and do you think two hundred fifty thousand dollars for one more side is that an appropriate cost? Well, it's the one whole side, which is the north side, and then some other areas that, since we had it pointed, that have failed mm -hmm. um, along the south side, down along those buttresses that are there, and, mm -hmm. um, down along the driveway, and then the inside, the inside mm -hmm. stuff needs to be addressed as well. Uh, Don't you put in sixty thousand for over for the other three sides over three years, and that yet this is two hundred. So what? Why so much more for? It was twenty thousand dollars each year, right. and um, you know they would they would pick a chunk and, and do it. They back when it was, it was Cooper Masonry that did it over those three years. You know he was a one man show with a lift and you know make a cloud of dust. Those are no longer an option to do it that way anymore. Now you gotta <laughs> you gotta collect the dust. You gotta you know it's, it's just a, it's a bigger job. You know I know. Costs have escalated a lot. I know it sounds like a giant number. It is a giant number, um, but it was the only. It was the, in the short notice that we had to get the, to prepare this. It was it was Sullivan and Mary out of Hoyo, which was the only game in town that would you know entertain uh, estimating um, that job. Um, there's not a whole lot of guys left that do that, but certainly you know, we can look around more and out toward the central part of the state and see if there's more contractors and get the price down. Well, I think 
generally what you see with most applications is that the party who's going to do the work isn't the one who's identifying the scope of work. I mean, that's where I think my sense of unease comes from. Not, I, I'm not saying that, I'm not questioning anyone's, uh, you, know, <laughs> you know, incentives here, but yeah. I mean, generally, you, that's the point of having an engineer or an architect, you know, who's, who's, who's does historic restoration work, preservation work, identify here's what needs to be repointed, you know, bottom line to keep the building up and here's what would be great to add to it, and then you go and price that out. So it's really hard to understand, you know, how, and it's not our money <laughs> that pay, so. Um, I, I also, this needs to be done um, according to the Secretary of the Interior Standards, and I understand that the windows are not the original windows, and so um, that makes a difference, but who are you looking to for guidance on how to comply with that? Uh, the photos was the big thing, and what kind of window was in the front of that building, and what did the window look like um, you know, back in the day? And Seth found that picture just, I think, yesterday of the front of the building. So now we know what the window, the window looks like. We know it needs to meet an energy efficiency um, window. I, there, I don't. I don't know what those standards are. Um, I don't know if there's any requirement with this particular building, given what you're doing, of match trying to match the mortar. I don't know. You know th those sorts of issues. I think you would need some some guidance on this. Sarah, can you help me here? Yeah, and so there, really for different types of projects, there are different standards right. that apply uh, that are prescribed by the Department of the Interior. So generally, with a project of this scope, there would be a historic preservation consultant providing input for how it, how, it, how it would comply. Okay, that's great information. And we haven't ever applied for someone for this, so it's all great information. One of the issues that we struggle with is um, public funding of, uh, in terms of historic preservation, of buildings that don't really have public access. Um, so you have, you, know, you have wonderful services for diverse clients from Northampton and other communities, but it's not open to the public. So we'd be funding with public money, taxpayer money, a building that for the most part, is not open um, to the to the public. Uh, is open to your clients and, and your staff, um, and so that's a, that is a concern of ours. Can you speak to that? Well, we, we do serve um, a segment of the public. It's not open for people to come in whenever they want. But one of the services we have there, called the Recovery Zone is um, a drop-in center for people with mental illness or uh, self-identified you know, people who um, need support because of, by virtue of having a serious mental illness, and they have various activities. You saw the photos that we have uh, showed you. So, um, and the REACH program, which serves um, children, at-risk at children, and there'll be play groups. Um, they're moving there, we just moved out uh, when we have because of um, having the new building up in Village Hill. So we're in the process now of um, doing some changes, minor renovations, so that the REACH program can go in. Um, they serve people throughout the region, uh, families, uh, short-term treatment for families that have at-risk children that either have a physical or uh, psychological or um, uh, disability of some sort. And um, most of the children that come through the programs, uh, it's fairly short term. For it, we only serve children birth to three, and they go on to public schools. And many, many people have come through that program. And the play groups are actually open to um, children who are not part of the REACH program, because the philosophy of the state uh, it, that funds it is that um, it's actually funded through a number of, of sources. But um, we actually can bill at a higher rate. If we have integrated groups where we have children that don't have any risk factors or disabilities coming to the play groups with the children that do have the disabilities, so it's not open like anybody can't just walk in. But we have um, we have services for young kids of from any any family that wants to come. Um, 
and the other services there are right now, um, there's an outreach program. Th this could change over time. It has changed over time. We, we used to have a day treatment program in the building. Uh, and as ServiceNet has evolved and some, certain programs started there and then grew too large and we had to move them somewhere else. But um, well, I have to say that over the years that we've been involved with the building, which is since um, 1995, um, I don't have, a, I can't give you an actual number, but a lot of people from the area have had services there. Um, we used to have our outpatient clinic there, and um, now it's on Pleasant Street. Our, uh, we, we merged actually in, in 1995. Um, we, the, the organization that I was director of was, was called Valley Programs, and we had an outpatient clinic um, in this building, and we merged with FICMIC, Franklin Hampshire Community Mental Health Center. And we merged our two clinics, so we moved it to their clinic, which was larger. And that's uh, when we, we actually um, acquired the building with the merged agency, then had the Pleasant Street uh, outpatient clinic. So we no longer had outpatient services um, at the Armory building. But prior to that, um, as you may know, our outpatient clinics, um, the, f the five clinics that we have throughout the area, do serve people from all walks of life. and. Um, all different kinds of insurance, Mass Health, Medicaid, Medicare, um, and we serve people with serious mental illness, people with developmental disabilities, and people with short-term um, needs, like if they have a marital, they want couples counseling, and we, so we serve a large number. We did at that time, now that that's on Pleasant Street, but over the years, we certainly, are, I wish I had a number, I have no idea <laughs> how many people have come through our doors and, and uh, receive services in that building. So it's not a drop, it's not a place like the library where anybody could go. But I would venture guess that more people over the last couple of decades have received services are in there than maybe at the Forbes Library, even though anybody could theoretically go to the Forbes Library. Um, each so. year the agency as a whole serves over 12,000 people? Yeah, we serve 12,000 people a year as an agency. Not, of course, not alone. Don't know. Thank you. That's very helpful. Yeah. Uh, Other questions? Yeah, do you have any sense of, I mean, this seems like, a, this building seems like a huge financial burden to have to deal with every year and, and just thinking about it long term. I mean, do you see, do you have a sense of what you're spending maintenance wise on this building with the deferred maintenance that you wish you could? Uh, I could look that up. I things? could look that up easily, <laughs> but I don't have the information at my fingertips. Uh, you probably have more of an off the top of your head idea because you're the person who oversees all the work that gets done. I have no, I really have no idea. I mean, it's hard to, it's, <laughs> you want to judge it against, you know, if we had a building that was 10 years old or something, right? Yeah. I mean, it's it's a, just an could, enormous we, undertaking to. We have our, you know, our, like our cost center, everything's all segregated out, so I could look it up and we could certainly get that information to you. Do you have an idea? I mean, other than the pointing over the last three years was a big ticket item. Um, the, the furnaces have all been good. They're, they still got a lot of life left in them. Uh, the area handlers above the, the back section are still in really good shape. Um, we had part of the roof replaced. Um, when was that? Five years ago. Five years five ago. Years. 25. Um, and 15. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Part of it was done 15 years ago over the old gymnasium. And then 25 years ago, uh, the flat sections were redone. And they've been repaired and maintained over the years. But you're right, it's a big building, gets a lot of issues mm -hmm. uh, with, any, with any old building. Yeah. But we're committed, I mean, I guess one thing um, to know is that we're committed to this building. We bought it, and when we bought it, we made the commitment that we were going to keep it up and that we were going to use it for our purposes. Um, and that it's changed and morphed over the years. What has been, as I said, which programs have been located there? Um, and we're, we're an organization that's grown fairly rapidly and changed over time, so it hasn't always been the same thing. But we are committed to making sure that we maintain the building. We certainly did our due diligence before we bought it um, to make sure that it was something we could take on and commit to. Do you, do you own all the buildings you operate out of? Not all of them. Um, we own probably, off the top of my head again, maybe three quarters of the group homes. We also, oh, well, if we count the SIL, uh, we have a partnership with a nonprofit organization based in Connecticut 
that um, we it works that we find a group home we find a property that uh, we want to operate a group home in they actually buy the property and renovate it if necessary and lease it to us um, under a capital lease and then when the mortgage is paid off they donate it to us so we we treat it on our financial records as it's a, a capital lease is treated as similarly to if we owned it and we're paying off a mortgage but we technically don't own those so if you don't count the SIL projects, probably about half, half of the group homes we own. We, we only started working with SIL. Um, time five, maybe five to eight five years to eight ago? Five years, I don't know, eight years ago or so. Before that, we bought most of our group homes. We rented a few. Um, we do own the, the project, uh, the, the, the new administrative building, uh, Village Hill. Village Hill. We own the, the Pleasant Street building, which we inherited from that merger. We own, Some of, hmm? we own Greenfield as well? Yeah, yeah we own the Greenfield yeah. Clinic. It's a condo in a, in a, big, a big building. It's an office uh, building that, that's a condo. So we own that. So the Pleasant Street building, was that a, simply a structural problem? Or was there any the, historical restoration the, with that? The foundation was caving into the sidewalk. <laughs> Along that Pleasant Street corridor, the oh. sidewalks that you walk on are actually the basements of the buildings that are there. Oh, under the sidewalks. Yeah. yeah. So the beam, the steel beam, from from the water infiltration over the years, the salt water had eaten away at the steel beams that holds up the front facade. Mm -hmm. So the sidewalk was the was the ceiling in the basement. So those beams were rusting bad enough where we ended up having to have the structural engineer come in and design some structural beams uh, to hold up that sidewalk and that front front facade. It's all underground. It's all in the basement, so you never saw it. I can walk on that sidewalk with uh, <laughs> <You> <laughs> front of these. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I feel so much better. Yeah. So you, have a, you have a building on Nanotech, is that right, in Florence? No, no. we rented that. That was rented rent space. <coughs> we, um, we ended those leases when we moved into it. Well, we still lease uh, some storage space there. And one, one um, the conference space that we had leased, we had separate, separate leases for different parts of the space. Some of them ended at a different times, so we still have the conference space there. We're going to use that for another year, I guess. Another year. About a so year. So you, you weren't involved in any any restoration with any of that before you no. leased it? Mm -mm. The Grove Street Inn on Grove Street down here is our, is our one of ours. We got it from the city, was it last year? Yeah. Two, two years ago. Um, they turned it over to us. We ran it for years and years, but they turned the building over to us. So then part of that, we, we released it for like a dollar a year or something, and then they gave, they donated it to us. And 43 Center Street, which is the old health club, we own mm -hmm. the condo downstairs with drop in center and the cot and the winter cot shelters. Okay. Have you ever come before this committee for funds? No. Mm -hmm. Thank oh, we did, we did a couple of years ago. Oh, did oh. we? I forgot. No, it was a um, rent, it was a project through our shelter and housing division where we got, I believe it was something like $10,000 that we used as a revolving fund to help homeless people to secure apartments through deposits, first month's rent, mm -hmm. and that they would hopefully pay us back. Um, it was, wasn't as successful as we wanted it to be, but it did help people find housing, but it, we, we couldn't get everybody to pay it back, but we were able to find, help people get housing. Right. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you, Sue and Tom and Jeff. And Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thank you. Um, the things that you asked for, the piece of information, we will work on getting those to you in the next. Do you have a timeline for which you want those? Uh, sooner is better. Okay. We meet again in two weeks. Okay. So, so before that. Yep. Yep. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. Three weeks. Oh, three weeks. Three weeks. Uh, there's a. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Staggered. Right. Yes. Uh, last on the agenda. Any other business not foreseen when the agenda was published? Nothing on that. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? All in favor?